The Dawn Flows Home to the Sea, Part Two, by Mikhail Sholokhov, continued. Inside, Grigor something seemed to snap. A sudden spasm of tears shook his body. His throat was clutched with convulsive sorrow. Choking back his tears, he greedily waited for the solo singer to begin and soundlessly whispered after him the words he had known ever since childhood. And their ataman was Yermak, son of Timofey, while their captain was Astashka, son of Lavrienti. The moment the solo singer struck up the first words of the song, the Cossacks traveling in the wagons ceased talking. The drivers stopped urging on their horses, and that train of thousands of wagons moved along in a profound, a sensitive silence. Only the clatter of the wheels and the squelch of horse hoofs kneading the mud was to be heard as the soloist, carefully enunciating the syllables, sang the first words of each verse. A single ancient song which had outlived the ages, lived and ruled over the somber steppe. In artless, simple words, it told of the free Cossacks' ancestors who at one time had fearlessly shattered the Tsarist troops, who had wandered along the Dawn and the Volga in their light, piratic barges, pillaging the Tsarist ships, squeezing the merchants, the nobles, and the governors, humbling distant Siberia. And the descendants of the Free Cossacks, shamefully retreating after being broken in an inglorious war against the people of Russia, listened to the mighty song in a gloomy silence. The regiment passed on, overtaking the wagons. The singers rode far beyond the refugees. But for a long time afterwards, the wagons rolled on in an enchanted silence, and no talk came from them, nor shout at the weary horses. But out of the darkness the song floated back from afar and spread spaciously like the dawn in flood. All their thoughts they thought as one, and as the summer passed, the warmth of summer and winter came, brothers, the chilly winter. How and where, brothers, shall we spend that winter? To move on to the Yaik is a long, long march. And if we wander along the Volga, all will think us thieves. If on to Kazan city we go, there is the Tsar, like the menacing Tsar Ivan Vasilyevich. Now the singers were no longer to be heard, but the accompaniment rang out, died down, and again flew up. All listened to it in the same tense and moody silence. And also, as though in a dream, Grigor remembered coming to his senses in a warm room. Without opening his eyes, in all his body he felt the pleasant freshness of clean bed linen. The strong smell of some medicine tickled his nose. At first he thought he was in a hospital, but from the next room came a burst of unrestrainable masculine laughter, the clatter of utensils and drunken voices. Some familiar bass voice said, And you're a clever one. You should have found out where our regiment was and we'd have helped. Well, drink up. What the devil are you hanging fire for? Prokhor answered in a tearful, drunken voice, By God, how was I to know? Do you think I found it easy nursing him? I fed him with sips as though he was a little baby and gave him milk to drink by the true Christ. I chewed his bread for him and thrust it into his mouth. By God, I did. I opened his teeth with the point of my saber. And one time I began to pour milk into his throat and he choked and all but died. I can't bear to think of it. Did you give him a bath yesterday? I gave him a bath and ran the clippers over his hair and spent all I had on milk. Not that I regret it. You can have every bit of it for all I care, but to chew his food and feed him by hand. Do you think that's easy? Don't say it was or I'll strike you for all your rank. Prokhor, Harlampi Yermakov, and Pyotr Bagatyryev, his gray karakul fur cap thrust on the back of his head, his face as red as a beet, also Platon Ryabchikov, and two other strange Cossacks came into Grigor's room. He's awake! Yermakov gave a mad shout, making with uncertain steps towards Grigor. Shaking a bottle and weeping, the dashing and merry Platon Ryabchikov bawled, Grisha, dear old lad, do you remember how we galloped along the Chira and how we fought? Where is our glory gone? What are the generals making of us and what have they done with our army, curse them? 
Have you come round? Here, drink. You'll feel better at once. It's pure liquor. We found you despite yourself, Yermakov muttered, his black, oily eyes glittering joyously. He dropped heavily on Grigor's bed, crushing it under his weight. Where are we? Grigor asked faintly, shifting his eyes with difficulty, passing them over the Cossacks' familiar faces. We've captured Yekaterinodar. We're retreating farther soon. Drink, Grigor Pantelyevich, our old pal. Get up, for God's sake. I can't bear to see you lying there. Lyabchikov fell on Grigor's feet. But Bagatiryev, who was smiling silently and seemed to be more sober than the others, seized him by his belt, easily lifted him, and carefully laid him down on the floor. Take the bottle from him. It'll be wasted, Yermakov exclaimed in alarm. With a broad, drunken smile, turning to Grigor, he said, Do you know what we're drinking? As the Cossacks have got to live in a foreign land, we looted a wine warehouse so it wouldn't fall into the Reds' hands. And the stuff we found, you wouldn't believe it. We fired at a cistern with our rifles and made a hole in it, and liquor poured out of it as if out of a tap. We riddled the cistern with bullets, and each man stood by a hole, putting caps, pails, and flasks under them, while others caught it straight in their palms and drank on the spot. We sabered the two volunteers guarding the warehouse and got to the stuff, and then the fun began. I saw one brave little Cossack climb on top of the cistern, evidently intending to draw out liquor through the top with a horse bucket, but he fell in and was drowned. The floor was a concrete one. The liquor poured all over it up to our knees, and the Cossacks went wading about in it, bending down and drinking like horses in a stream from right under their feet, and they lay down on the spot. There'll be more than one drink himself to death. And we did ourselves proud there, too. We don't need much. We rolled back a barrel holding a good five bucketfuls, and that's enough for us. Drink your fill, my soul. In any case, our gentle dawn is finished. Platon all but got drowned. They flung him down on the floor and held him by his feet. He took a couple of mouthfuls and was ready to snuff out. I pulled him away by sheer force. All of them smelt strongly of liquor, onion, and tobacco. Grigor had a slight feeling of nausea, of dizziness. Smiling a weak, exhausted smile, he closed his eyes. Chapter 7 He lay a week in Yekaterinodar, in a house belonging to an acquaintance of Bagatiryev's, slowly recovering after his illness. Then, as Prokhor said, he began to mend and at the village of Abinskaya he sat a horse for the first time during all the retreat. Novorossiysk was being evacuated. Steamers were transporting the Russian money bags, landowners, generals' families, and influential politicians into Turkey. Ships were being loaded day and night at all the quays. Junkers were working as gangs of stevedores, filling the steamer's holds with military property and the trunks and boxes of the refugee notables. The forces of the volunteer army outstripped the Don and Kuban Cossacks in the flight, and they were the first to arrive at Navarasisk. They crowded onto the transport vessels. The staff of the volunteer army prudently betook themselves to the British dreadnought, which had arrived at the port. Fighting was going on close to Tanyelnaya, Tens of thousands of refugees thronged the streets of the town. Military forces continued to arrive. There was an indescribable press of people at the quays. Abandoned horses wandered in droves of thousands over the lime slopes of the hills surrounding Novorossiysk. The streets around the harbor were piled high with Cossack saddles, equipment, and military property, all of which was no longer wanted by anyone. Rumors sped through the town that only the volunteer army was to be taken on board the vessels, while the Don and Kuban Cossacks would have to proceed by forced marches to Georgia. On the morning of March 25, 1920, Grigor and Platon Ryabchikov went to the quay to find out whether the forces of the Second Don Corps would be embarked. The previous evening, the rumor had spread among the Cossacks that General Denikin had issued the order to carry to the Crimea all the Don Cossacks who had retained their equipment and horses. The quay was a solid mass of Kalmyks from the Salsk region. 
They had driven droves of horses and camels from Manich and Sal, and had carried their wooden dwelling huts as far as the sea. Turning up their noses at the sour scent of sheep fat given off by this crowd, Grigor and Ryabchikov approached the gangway of a large transport steamer moored alongside the quay. The gangways were guarded by a reinforced guard of officers from the Markov Division. Don Cossack artillerymen were crowded close by, awaiting embarkation. The stern of the vessel was littered with guns under khaki tarpaulins. Forcibly pushing his way through the crowd, Grigor asked a youthful-looking black-mustached sergeant, What is this battery, friend? The sergeant gave Grigor a sidelong look and reluctantly answered, The 36th. From Kargin? Yes. Who's in charge of the embarkation? Why, there he stands by the rail. Some colonel he is. The Objikov pulled Grigor's sleeve and angrily said, Let's go, and then go to the devil. Do you think you'll get any sense out of this lot? They needed us when we were fighting, but they've got no use for us now. The sergeant smiled and winked at the artillery men drawn up in line. You're lucky, men. They're even turning down the officers. The colonel in charge of embarkation operations swiftly came down the gangway. After him hurried a bald-headed official in an expensive, unbuttoned sheepskin. The man imploringly pressed his catskin cap to his chest and made some remark. There was such a beseeching expression on his sweaty face and in his short-sighted eyes that the colonel turned away and shouted roughly, I've already told you once, don't pester me or I'll give orders for you to be taken to the shore. You've lost your wits. Where the devil can we put your rubbish? Are you blind? You can see what's happening. Oh, go away. For God's sake, go and complain to General Denikin himself, if you like. I've said I can't, and I can't. Don't you understand Russian? Turning to rid himself of the importunate official, the colonel started to pass Grigor. Grigor barred his way, and putting his hand to the visor of his cap, agitatedly asked, Can officers count on being embarked? Not on this vessel. There's no room. Then on which one? You'll find out at the evacuation point. We've been there, but they don't know anything. Nor do I know. Let me pass. But you're embarking the 36th battery. Why isn't there room for us? Let me pass, I tell you. I'm not an information bureau. The colonel tried to push Grigor gently aside, but Grigor had planted his feet firmly apart. Bluish sparks flamed up and died away again in his eyes. So you don't need us now. But you did before, didn't you? Take your hand away. You won't shift me. The colonel gazed into Grigor's eyes and looked round. The Markov men, standing with crossed rifles at the gangway, could hardly restrain the surging crowd. Staring past Grigor, the colonel asked wearily, What is your regiment? I'm from the 19th Dawn Regiment. The others are from various regiments. How many of you are there altogether? Ten. I can't. There's no room. Ryabchikov saw Grigor's nostrils quivering as he said in an undertone, What game are you playing, you cur? You rear louse, let us pass at once, or... Grisha will cut him down in a minute, Ryabchikov thought with angry satisfaction. But seeing two Markov men hurrying to rescue the colonel, clearing a way through the crowd with their rifle butts, he touched Grigor's sleeve. Don't get mixed up with him, Grigor, come on. You're an idiot, and you shall answer for your conduct, the colonel said, his face going white. Turning to the Markov men, he pointed to Grigor. Gentlemen, arrest this epileptic. You must establish order here. I've got urgent business with the Commandant, and here I've got to stand listening to all kinds of pleasantries from all kinds of... He hurriedly slipped past Grigor. A tall Markov man with neatly trimmed mustaches, wearing captain's epaulets on his blue tunic, went right up to Grigor and demanded, What do you want? Why are you violating discipline? A place on the steamer, that's what I want. Where is your regiment? I don't know. Show me your documents. The second man, a young, puffy-faced youngster in Pince-Nez, said in a quavering bass, We must take him to the guardroom. Don't waste time, Vysotsky. The captain carefully read Grigor's document and returned it. You must find your regiment. I advise you to clear out of here and not to interfere with the embarkation operations. We have been ordered to arrest all, irrespective of their rank, who violate discipline or interfere with the embarkation. 
The captain pursed up his lips, and giving Ryabchikov a sidelong glance, bent to Grigor's ear and whispered, I would advise you to have a talk with the commander of the 36th Battery. Stand in their ranks and you'll get on the steamer. Ryabchikov, who had heard the captain's whisper, said in a cheerful voice, You go to the Kargin men and I'll run and fetch the lads. What else shall I bring besides your saddlebags? We'll go together, Grigor said unconcernedly. On the way back, they met a Cossack acquaintance from Simonovsky village. He was driving a huge wagon load of baked bread, covered by a tarpaulin, to the quay. Ryabchikov called to the man, Hey, Fyodot, what are you carrying there? Ah, Platon and Grigor Pantelievich, greetings. I'm supplying my regiment with bread for the road. We've had it baked in a hurry, or we'd have only porridge to eat all the way. Grigor went up to the wagon and asked, are your loaves all weighed, or are they counted? Who the devils counted them? Why, do you want some bread? Yes. Take some, then. How much can I have? As much as you can carry. There's plenty here. Ryabchikov watched in amazement as Grigor took loaf after loaf, and unable to restrain his curiosity, asked at last, What the hell are you taking so much for? I need it, Grigor answered curtly. He asked the driver for two sacks, put the bread into them, thanked him for his kindness, and after saying goodbye, ordered Ryabchikov, Pick one up. We'll carry it. You aren't intending to spend the winter here, are you? Ryabchikov asked humorously as he tumbled the sack across his shoulder. It isn't for me. Then who is it for? My horse. Ryabchikov neatly swung the sack to the ground and asked in bewilderment, Are you joking? No, I'm quite serious. So you... What have you got in your mind, Pantelievich? Are you intending to remain behind? Is that the idea? You've got it. Pick up the sack and let's go on. My horse has got to be fed. He's already chewed all the manger. A horse may be of value yet. You can't serve on foot. As far as their quarters, Ryabchikov did not say another word, but groaned and shifted the sack from shoulder to shoulder. As they went up to the wicket gate, he asked, Will you tell the boys? Without waiting for an answer, in an aggrieved tone, he said, You've got a fine idea into your head, but how about us? That's for you to decide, Grigor answered with affected unconcern. If they won't take us, if they can't find room for us, well, they needn't. What the hell do we want them for, to cling on to? We'll stay behind. We'll try our luck. Get on. What have you got stuck in the wicket gate for? fine way of talking to me. I didn't even see the wicked gate. Well, it's a funny business. You've given me a fine clout on the ear, Grisha. Knocked me down with a feather. And there I was thinking, what the devil has he asked for all that bread for? Now our lads will find out and get all worked up. Well, and how about you? Won't you remain? Grigor was curious to know. What are you thinking of? Ryabchikov exclaimed in alarm. You think it over. There's nothing to think over. I'll go off without talking about it while I've got the chance. I'll attach myself to the Kargin battery and clear out. You'll regret it. Oh, yes, of course. I value my head more than that, brother. I've got no desire to have the Reds try their executioners on it. But do think it over, Platon. The position is... Don't talk about it. I'm going off at once. Well, as you wish, I won't try to argue with you, Grigor said irritably and was the first to stride towards the stone steps leading to the porch. Yermakov, Prokhor, and Bagatiriev were all out. The mistress of the house, an elderly, hunchbacked Armenian woman, said the Cossacks had gone off, saying they would be back soon. Keeping on his outdoor clothes, Grigor cut up a loaf of bread into great chunks and went out to the horses in the stable. He divided the bread into two portions and gave half to his own and half to Prokhor's horse. He had just picked up the bucket to bring some water when Ryabchikov appeared at the stable door. In the folds of his greatcoat, Platon was carefully carrying bread broken into large pieces. Scenting its master, his horse gave a brief snort. Ryabchikov silently passed the quietly smiling Grigor, and without looking up, said as he rolled the pieces of bread into the manger, Don't bare your teeth like that, please. If you show such an example, then I've got to feed my horse, too. Do you think I'd be glad to go? I'd have to take myself by my own collar and run myself to that damned steamer. 
I wouldn't get there any other way. It's living fear that's driving me on. I've only got one head on my shoulders, haven't I? God grant I don't get this one cut off. A second wouldn't grow in time for Lady Day. Prokhar and the others did not return until late in the afternoon. Yermakov was carrying a huge bottle of liquor, while Prokhor had a kit bag full of hermetically sealed flasks containing a thick yellow liquid. We've done a fine day's work, enough for all night, Yermakov boasted as he pointed to the bottle. He went on to explain, We came across a military doctor who asked us to help him carry medical goods from a warehouse to the quay. The stevedores had refused to work, and there were only yunkers dragging things from the warehouses, so we teamed up with them. The doctor paid us for our help with liquor, but Prokhor pinched these flasks. By God, I'm not joking. But what's in them? Ryabchikov asked inquisitively. They're purer than liquor, brother. Prokhor shook up the flasks and held them up to the light, revealing a thick fluid bubbling inside the dark glass, and ended in a self-satisfied tone, that's nothing but expensive foreign wine. They only give it to the sick, so a Junker woman who knows English told me. We'll get on board the steamer, drink in our misery, strike up my dear beloved country, and drink all the way to the Crimea, and we'll throw the flasks into the sea. Hurry up and embark, or they'll have to hold up the steamer for you and won't get away. Where's Prokhor Zikov, the hero of heroes? We can't sail without him, they'll be saying, the Objikov said with a sneer. Pointing a yellow, smoke-stained finger at Gregor, he added, he's changed his mind about going, and so have I. You don't say, Prokhor groaned, almost dropping a flask in his amazement. What's all this? What have you got into your head now, Yermakov asked, frowning and staring fixedly at Gregor. We've decided not to go. Why? Because there isn't any room for us. Well, if there isn't today, there will be tomorrow, Bogatyryov said confidently. Have you been to the quay? Well, what about it? Have you seen what's happening there? Well, yes. Well, well. If you've seen, what is there to explain? They would only take me and Ryabchikov, and then a volunteer told us we were to fall in with the Kargin battery, otherwise it wouldn't be possible. It hasn't embarked yet, has it? The battery, I mean, Bogatyryov asked swiftly. Learning that the men of the battery were standing in line awaiting embarkation, he at once made ready to go. He packed his linen spare trousers and a tunic in his kit bag, added some bread, and said goodbye. Stay with us, Pyotr, Yermakov advised him. There's no point in breaking up the party. Without answering, Bogatyryov held out his hand, bowed once more at the door, and said, Keep well. If it's God's will, we shall meet again. Then he ran out. After his departure, there was a long, unpleasant silence in the room. Yermakov went into the kitchen to see the mistress, brought back four glasses, silently poured liquor into them, set a great copper teapot filled with cold water on the table, cut up bacon fat, and, still not saying a word, sat down at the table, rested his head on his elbows, gazed numbly at his feet for several minutes, drank some water straight from the teapot spout, and asked hoarsely, Why does the water always stink of paraffin in the Kuban? Nobody answered. Ryabchikov wiped the steamy blade of his saber with a clean twig. Gregor rummaged in his bag. Prokhor abstractedly gazed out of the window at the bare slopes of the hills, sprinkled with droves of horses. Sit down at the table and let's drink. Without waiting for the others, Yermakov flung half a glass of liquor down his throat and took a drink of water. Chewing a piece of bacon, looking at Gregor with more cheerful eyes, he asked, I suppose the Red Comrades won't make mincemeat of us. They won't kill all of us. More than a thousand men will be left behind here, Gregor answered. I'm not worrying about all of us, Yermakov laughed. I'm only concerned with my own skin. When they had drunk plentifully, the conversation took a more cheerful turn. But a little later, Bogatyryev unexpectedly returned, frowning and sullen, his face blue with cold. He flung down a whole bale of new-looking English tunics at the door and silently began to undress. Welcome back, Prokhor said viciously with a bow. Bogatyryev shot an angry glance at him and said with a sigh, 
If every one of these Denikin men and other bastards were to plead with me, I wouldn't go. I stood in the queue, got frozen stiff and all for nothing. They stopped short just in front of me. There were two men left in front of me, and they took one and not the other. Half the battery's been left behind. What do you call that? That's the way they deal with the likes of us, Yermakov burst into a roar of laughter, and splashing the liquid out of the bottle, poured out a full glass for Bogatyryev. Here, drink to your misery, or will you wait for them to come and ask you to go? Look out of the window. That's not General Vrangel coming for you, is it? Without answering, Bogatyryev sucked the liquor through his teeth. He was in no humor for jokes. But Yermakov and Vyabchikov, both of them half drunk, regaled the old Armenian woman until she could hold no more, then talked of going out to find an accordion player somewhere or other. You'd better go to the station, Bogatyryev advised them. They're opening up the freight cars. There's a whole trainload of uniforms going begging. What the devil do we want your uniforms for, Yermakov shouted. The tunics you've brought along will be enough for us. They'll strip us of everything extra in any case. Piotr, you hound, we've decided to go over to the Reds, understand? Are we Cossacks or what? If the Reds allow us to live, we'll go and serve them. We're Don Cossacks, Cossacks of the purest blood without any mixture. Fighting's our job. Do you know how I wield my saber? Like a cabbage stump. Stand up and I'll try my hand on you. What? Feeling too weak? It's all the same to us whom we saber, so long as we can saber someone. That's true, isn't it, Melyakov? Don't worry, Grigor answered wearily. His bloodshot eyes squinting, Yermakov tried to get at his saber, which was lying on a chest. Bagatiryev good-humoredly pushed him away and asked, Don't rage too much, Anika the warrior, or I'll quiet you down at once. Drink in moderation. Remember, you're an officer. I'll resign my rank together with the epaulets. At the moment, I need it just about as much as a pig needs a trough. Don't remind me of it. Shall I cut your epaulets off for you? Piotr, my sorrow, wait a bit. I'll have them off in a jiffy. It's not time for that yet. There's plenty of time yet, Bogatyryev laughed, pushing aside his uncontrollable friend. They drank till dawn. During the evening, other Cossacks turned up, one of them with an accordion. Yermakov danced the Cossack dance until he dropped. They dragged him aside, and he at once fell asleep on the bare floor, throwing his legs wide apart, flinging his head back awkwardly. The cheerless carousal lasted until morning. I'm from Kumshatka, one of the strangers, an elderly Cossack said, sobbing drunkenly. We had bullocks so big you couldn't reach their horns from the ground. My horses were like lions. And now what have we got left on the farm? Only one mangy bitch, and she'll die soon. There's nothing for her to feed on. A Kuban Cossack, in a ragged Circassian coat, ordered the accordion player to strike up a Naursk dance, and picturesquely throwing out his arms, slipped about the room with such astonishing agility that Grigor felt sure the soles of his boots did not touch the scratched, dirty floor at all. At midnight, several of the Cossacks brought two tall, narrow-throated earthenware pitchers from somewhere or other. Half-rotting, faded labels were stuck to their sides, their corks were sealed, and massive leaden seals hung from the cherry-red sealing wax. Prokhor held the huge pitcher, which contained perhaps a bucket full of liquid, in his hands, painfully moving his lips, trying to read the foreign words on the label. Yermakov, who had woke up, took the pitcher from him, set it down on the floor, and drew his saber. Before Prokhor had time to groan, he cut through the neck with a slanting stroke of his saber and shouted, Bring your glasses! The thick, amazingly aromatic and bitter liqueur was disposed of in a few minutes. Lyabchikov clicked his tongue again and again in ecstasy and muttered, That's not wine, but the blessed sacrament. That's only to be drunk before your death, and then not by everybody. But only those who've never played cards, never sniffed tobacco, never touched women. It's a drink for bishops, in a word. Then Prokhor remembered that he had the flasks of medicinal wine in his kit bag and cried, Wait, Platon, don't boast too soon. I've got better wine than that. 
That's muck, but the stuff I got from the warehouse, now that's wine. Incense with honey, and maybe even better. It's not Bishop's wine, brother, but I tell you straight, it's Tsar's wine. In the old days, the Tsars drank it, but now it's fallen to our lot, he bragged away as he opened one of the flasks. Ryabchikov, always ready for a drink, swallowed half a glass of the thick fluid in one gulp. He at once turned pale and his eyes bulged. That's not wine, it's carbolic, he shouted hoarsely. In his fury, spitting the remains from his glass over Prokhor's shirt, he rushed staggering into the passage. He's lying, the snake, it's English wine, the finest quality. Don't believe him, brothers. Prokhor bawled, trying to outshout the babel of voices. He tossed off a whole glassful of the liquid and at once turned even paler than Ryabchikov. Well, what's it like? Yermakov asked, dilating his nostrils and gazing into Prokhor's bleary eyes. Like Tsar's wine? Strong? Sweet? Speak up now, you devil, or I'll smash this flask over your head. Suffering silently, Prokhor shook his head, hiccuped, nimbly jumped up and rushed out after Ryabchikov. Choking with laughter, Yermakov winked conspiratorially at Gregor and went out into the yard. A minute or so later he came back, laughing so uproariously that he drowned all the other voices in the room. "'What's all that for?' Grigor asked wearily. "'What are you neighing for, idiot?' "'Oh, my boy, go and look at the way they're turning their insides out. Do you know what they drank?' "'Well, what?' "'Some English anti-louse ointment.' "'You're lying.' "'It's God's truth. When I was at the warehouse, I thought it was wine, too, but then I asked the doctor. "'What's this stuff, doctor?' Medicine, he said. It doesn't happen to be the remedy for all sorrows, I asked. It isn't liquor, is it? God forbid, he said. It's some anti-louse ointment the Allies have sent us. It's for external application. It mustn't be taken inside at all. Then why didn't you tell them, you fool? Gregor asked in angry reproach. Let the devils clean themselves before surrendering. I don't suppose they'll die, Yermakov wiped the tears from his eyes and added, not without a touch of malevolence. And besides, now they'll drink a little more steadily. You couldn't keep up with them before. Such thirsty souls need a lesson. Well, shall you and I have a drink, or shall we wait a bit? Let's drink to our end. Just before daybreak, Gregor went out on the porch. With trembling fingers, rolled himself a cigarette, lit it, and stood in the mist with his back against the damp wall. The house was riotous with drunken shouts, the sobbing tones of the accordion and furious whistling. The heels of the ardent dancers unwearyingly drummed out a fine tattoo. But the wind carried the thick, low wail of a steamer siren from the bay. On the keys, the human voices blended into a solid roar, broken by loud shouts of command, the neighing of horses, the whistles of steamers. Somewhere along the railway, the line fighting was going on. There was a muffled thunder of guns. In the intervals between the shots, the burning rattle of machine gun fire was faintly audible. Beyond the mountain pass, a rocket flew high into the heavens, sprinkling light. For a few seconds, the humped summits of the mountains grew visible, lit up by a green, translucent light, then the sticky darkness of the southern night covered the hills once more, and the artillery cannonade sounded still more distinctly and frequently, blending into a steady roar of gunfire. Chapter 8 A cold, salty, heavy wind was blowing from the sea. It carried the scent of strange, unknown lands to the shore. But to the Don Cossacks, not only the wind, but all else was strange, unhomelike, in that boring seaside town with its innumerable drafts. They stood on the quay in a solid mass, waiting to be embarked. Green, foaming waves seethed along the shore. A chilly sun peered at the earth through the clouds. In the roadstead, English and French destroyers were smoking. A dreadnought hung its gray, menacing bulk above the water. Over it spread a black pall of smoke. An ominous silence hung around the keys. Where the last transport had recently been swinging at her moorings, officers' saddles, trunks, clothing, sheepskin coats, 
chairs upholstered in crimson plush and other jumble hurriedly flung from the gangways were floating. Early in the morning, Gregor rode down to the quay. Giving Prochor charge of his horse, he spent a long time in the crowd looking for acquaintances, listening to the disconnected, anxious talk. He saw an elderly retired colonel who had been refused a place on the last steamer shoot himself on the gangway. A few minutes previously, the colonel, a little fussy man with a gray scrub on his cheeks, with tear-stained, swollen, marsupial eyes, had seized the officer of the guard by the strap of his sword belt, had miserably whispered something, sniffling and wiping his tobacco-stained mustache, eyes, and trembling lips with a dirty handkerchief. Then he had suddenly appeared to make up his mind. A moment later, some swift-fingered Cossack drew the gleaming browning from the dead man's warm hand, and with his feet rolled the body in its light gray officer's greatcoat to a pile of boxes. Then the crowd seethed still more furiously around the gangway. The fighting in the queues grew still more violent. The hoarse voices of the refugees rose in a harsh howl of rage. When the last steamer drew away from the quayside, there was a crescendo of women's sobs, hysterical cries, curses. Before the curt bass roar of the ship's siren had had time to die away, a young Kalmyk in a foxskin cap with ear and neck flaps jumped into the water and swam after the steamer. He couldn't wait, one of the Cossacks sighed. It's clear that whatever happened, he couldn't remain behind, said a Cossack standing close to Gregor. He must have done the Reds too much harm. Clenching his teeth, Gregor stared after the swimming Kalmyk. More and more slowly swung the swimmer's arms through the air. Lower and lower sank his shoulders. His saturated greatcoat was dragging him down. A wave washed his shabby red foxskin cap off his head and threw it back. The damned heathen will drown, some old man in a long Caucasian coat said commiseratively. Gregor turned sharply on his heel and went to his horse. He found Prochor talking excitedly to Ryabchikov and Bagatyryev, who had just galloped up. Seeing Gregor, Ryabchikov fidgeted in his saddle, impatiently dug his heels into his horse's flanks and shouted, Hurry up, Pantelyevich! Not waiting for Gregor to reach them, he shouted to him, Let's retreat before it's too late. We've collected a good half-squadron of Cossacks, and we're thinking of making our way to Galandzik, and then on to Georgia. How do you stand? His hands, thrust deep into the pockets of his greatcoat, silently pushing aside the aimlessly gathering Cossacks, Gregor went up to them. Will you come with us or not? Lyabjikov asked insistently, riding right up to him. No, I won't. We've got a Cossack military commander to join in with us. He knows every inch of the road and says he could lead us blindfold all the way to Tiflis. Come on, Grisha, and from there we'll go on to the Turks. What do you say? We've got to save ourselves somehow. We're getting near the end now, but you're just like a half-dead fish. No, I shan't go. Gregor took the reins from Prokhor's hand and climbed heavily like an old man into the saddle. I won't go. There's no point in it. And besides, it's rather late now. Look. Ryabchikov looked round, and in his despair and rage, crushed and tore away the sword knot on his saber. Lines of red army men were streaming down from the mountains. Machine guns feverishly began to rattle close to a cement works. Armored trains opened fire with their guns against the lines of men. The first shell burst near a windmill. Ride to our quarters, lads, and keep close behind me, Grigor ordered, suddenly cheering up and drawing himself erect again. But Ryabchikov seized Grigor's horse by the rein and exclaimed in alarm, Don't go. Let's stay here. You know, even death is beautiful when life is peaceful. Ah, you devil, come on. Why talk about death? What are you babbling? In his annoyance, Grigor was about to add something more but his voice was drowned by a thunderous roar from the sea. The British dreadnought had swung into position and had sent over a packet of shells from its twelve-inch guns. Covering the steamers sailing out of the bay, 
It raked the lines of red and green army men streaming down to the outskirts of the town, then transferred its fire to the top of the pass, where the red batteries had taken up positions. The British shells flew with an oppressive roar and howl over the heads of the Cossacks crowded on the quay. Pulling tightly on the reins, holding up his horse as it fell back on its haunches, through the roar of the firing, Bagatiriev shouted, Well, the British cannon use strong language, but they're wasting their fire. It's not doing anything, only making a lot of noise. Let them roar. It's all one to us now. Smiling, Gregor touched up his horse and rode down the street. Their horses prancing in a furious gallop, six horsemen with drawn sabers rode round a corner to meet him. Across the breast of the leading rider was a strip of blood-red bunting. Part Six Home at Last Chapter One for two days a warm wind had been blowing from the south. The last snow had melted off the fields. The foaming spring runnels had ceased their roaring. The gullies and rivulets of the steppe had finished gurgling. At dawn of the third day the wind died away and heavy mists descended over the steppe. The clumps of last year feather grass were silvered with moisture. The mounds, ravines and villages, the spires of the belfries... The arrowing crowns of the pyramidal poplars were all drowned in an impenetrable milky haze. That misty morning, for the first time after her recovery, Oxenia went out on the porch and stood long, intoxicated with the heady sweetness of the fresh spring air. Mastering her nausea and dizziness, she walked as far as the well in the orchard, put down the bucket, and seated herself on the parapet. Altogether different, marvelously fresh and enchanting seemed the world to Oxenia. With glittering eyes, she agitatedly gazed about her, fingering the folds of her dress as would a child. The enmisted distance, the apple trees in the orchard swimming with thaw water, the wet palings, and the road beyond them with its deep water-filled ruts, all seemed incredibly beautiful to her. Everything was blossoming, with heavy yet delicate tints, as though irradiated with sunlight. A scrap of clean sky peering through the haze dazzled her with its chilly azure. The scent of rotting straw and thawed black earth was so familiar and pleasant that she sighed deeply and smiled at the corners of her lips. The artless snatch of song of a skylark reaching her ears from somewhere in the misty steppe awakened an unconscious sadness within her. And it was that snatch of Skylark's song, heard in a strange land, that sent Oxenia's heart beating more quickly and wrung two meager little tears from her eyes. On Flows Home to the Sea, Part 2, by Mikhail Sholokhov, continued. And it was that snatch of Skylark's song, heard in a strange land, that sent Oxenia's heart beating more quickly, and wrung two meager little tears from her eyes. Unthinkingly rejoicing in the life which had returned to her, she experienced a tremendous desire to touch everything with her hands, to look at everything. She wanted to touch the currant bush which stood blackened with moisture, to press her cheek against the branch of an apple tree covered with a velvety pale pink bloom. She desired to stride across the fallen fencing and to walk through the mire away from all tracks to where beyond a broad hollow the fields of winter corn were showing wondrously green, merging with the misty distance. For several days Oxenia lived in the expectation that at any moment Gregor would turn up. But at last she learned from neighbors who called on her host that the war was still going on and that many Cossacks had sailed from Navarasisk to the Crimea, while those who had stayed behind had joined the Red Army or had been sent to the mines. By the end of the week she had firmly made up her mind to go home, and a traveling companion was quickly found for her. 
One evening a little hunchbacked man entered the hut without knocking. He bowed but did not speak, and began to unbutton the muddy English greatcoat, bursting at the seams, which was hanging around him like a sack. "'Why, my good man, what do you mean by not even saying good evening, but behaving as though you'd come to stay?' the master asked, staring at the uninvited guest in astonishment. The old man nimbly removed his greatcoat, shook it out on the threshold, and carefully hung it on a hook. Then, stroking his little gray beard, he smiled and said, "'Forgive me, for the love of Christ, my dear man, but I've learned my lesson for these times. First take off your things, and then ask if you can stay the night. Otherwise you won't be let in. These days the people have grown churlish. They aren't pleased to see guests. But where are we to put you? You can see we're crowded out already,' the master said more amicably. I don't need more room than a dog. I'll curl myself up here by the door and sleep. But who are you, Daddy? Did you run from the Soviets? The mistress asked inquisitively. You've hit it. I ran from the Soviets. I ran and ran and ran all the way to the sea. But now I'm quietly making my way back again. I'm tired of running, the garrulous old fellow answered, squatting down on his heels by the door. "'But who are you, all the same? Where are you from?' the master renewed the examination. The old man drew a large pair of tailor's scissors out of a pocket, turned them over and over in his hands, and said with the same fixed smile on his lips, "'Here's my document. I've come all the way from Navarasisk under its orders. But my native place is a long way off, the other side of Yashenska district, and that's where I'm off to now after having had a taste of the salt water in the sea.' "'I'm from Vyshenska, too, Daddy,' Aksinya cried in delight. "'You don't say!' the old man exclaimed. "'Well, of all the places to meet a fellow countrywoman in, "'though these days even that isn't surprising. "'We're like the Jews now. "'We're scattered over the face of the earth. "'In the Kuban it was so bad that if you threw a stick at a dog, "'you'd hit a Don Cossack. "'You came across them everywhere. "'You couldn't get away from them. "'And there were even more of them buried in the ground.' My dear people, I've seen all sorts of sights during this retreat. You wouldn't believe the misery the people are suffering. Two days ago I was sitting in a station, and beside me was a gentlewoman wearing spectacles, and through her spectacles she was looking for the lice on her, and they were marching over her in regiments, and there she was, picking them off with her fingers, and her face as sour as though she'd bitten a rotten apple. Every time she crushed one poor little louse, she frowned still more, as though she was about to double up and be sick. She looked so disgusted. And yet you'll find a stout fellow killing a man and not frowning in the least, not even turning up his nose. I saw one such daredevil cut down three kalmyks, and afterwards he wiped his saber on his horse's mane, took out a cigarette, lit it, rode up to me and asked, "'What are you staring your eyes out for, Daddy?' Do you want me to cut you down, too? What are you saying, my son, I said? God forbid. If you cut off my head, how shall I be able to chew my bread? He laughed and rode off. Say what you like. It's easier for a man to kill another man than to crush a louse. Men have grown cheap during the revolution, the master remarked sententiously. That's true, the guest confirmed. Men aren't cattle. They get used to anything. And so I asked this woman, Who might you be? By your face you don't look to be one of the common sort. She looked at me, her face swimming in tears, and said, I'm the wife of Major General Grechichin. Well, I thought, with all your major and with all your general, you're as lousy as a mangy cat. And I said to her, Excuse me, Your Excellency, but if you're going to kill off all your creeping insects at that rate, you'll be kept busy till the Feast of the Blessed Virgin and you'll break all your little nails, crush them all at one blow. But how can I, she asked, and so I told her. Take off your clothes, I said, spread them out on some hard spot, and hammer them with a bottle. And I saw my general's wife get up and run behind the water tower, and I saw her basting away at her clothes with a bottle of green glass, and doing it so well that she might have been used to it all her life. I stood admiring her and thinking, God has much to be responsible for. He's turned the insects loose even on people of noble birth. 
Let them suck their sweet blood, so to speak, and not always be drinking their fill of the toiler's blood. God's not a nobody. He knows his job. Sometimes he steals quietly up to people and deals with them so fairly that you couldn't think of anything better. The tailor rattled away incessantly, but seeing that the master and mistress were listening to him with the utmost attention, he adroitly hinted that he had many more interesting things to tell, but that he was so famished that he felt sleepy. After supper, as he was making himself comfortable for the night, he asked Oxenia, And you, fellow countrywoman, are you thinking of making a long stay here as guest? I'm getting ready to go home, Daddy. Well, then you come along with me. It'll be more cheerful for both of us. Oxenia willingly agreed, and next day, after taking leave of her host and hostess, they left the lonely steppe village of Novomihailovsky. They arrived at the village of Milyutinsky after nightfall on the twelfth day of their journey. At a large, prosperous-looking house, they asked permission to stay the night. Next morning, Oxenia's companion decided to stay for a week in the village to rest and heal his feet, which were chafed and bleeding. He was unable to walk any farther. Some tailoring work was found for him in the house, and the old man, who was eager to get back to his trade, nimbly made himself comfortable by the window, took out his scissors and a bunch of needles tied with string, and swiftly began to unpick some clothing. As he said goodbye to Oxenia, the old wag crossed himself and unexpectedly watered at the eyes. But he at once brushed away the tears and said with his usual jocularity, Need isn't your own mother, but it makes people kin. Here am I feeling sorry at leaving you. Well, there's nothing to be done about it. Go on alone, my daughter. Your guide has gone lame on all his legs. I expect someone fed him on barley bread somewhere. And besides, for my seventy years I've done a good march with you, and even too much. If you get the chance, tell my old woman that her grey dove is alive and well. He's been pounded in a mortar, but he's still alive, and he's sewing trousers for good people on his way. And he may turn up at home at any time. So you tell her. The old idiot has done retreating and is advancing back homeward. But he doesn't know when he'll be climbing onto the stove again. Oxenia spent several more days on the road. At Bakovskoy she found a wagon going her way and rode to Tatarsk. Late in the evening she passed through the wide-open wicket gate of her yard, glanced at the Melyukov hut, and choked with the sob which unexpectedly rose in her throat. In the empty kitchen, which smelt of neglect, she shed all the bitter feminine tears which had been accumulating for many a long day, then went down to the dawn for water, lit the stove, and sat down at the table, letting her hands fall to her knees. Lost in thought, she did not hear the door creak, and she was aroused from her reverie only when Ilinichna came in and quietly said, Well, greetings, neighbor. You've been away a long time in strange lands without our having any news of you. Oxenia gave her a startled look and rose to her feet. What are you staring at me for? Why don't you speak? You haven't brought bad news, have you? Ilinichna came slowly to the table and sat down on the edge of the bench, not shifting her questioning gaze from Oxenia's face. Why should I have news? I simply wasn't expecting you. I was sitting, thinking, and didn't hear you come in, Oxenia said in embarrassment. You've got terribly thin. There's hardly enough of you to keep your soul in. I've had typhus. And our Grigor, how is he? Where did you leave him? Is he still alive? Oxenia briefly told all she knew. Ilinichna listened to the end without saying a word, and then asked, When he left you, he wasn't ill, was he? No, he wasn't ill. And you haven't heard anything of him since? No. Ilinichna sighed with relief. Well, thank you for your good news. For here in the village all sorts of things are being said about him. What things? Oxenia asked almost inaudibly. Oh, it's all nonsense. You can't listen to all the stories going round. Of all our villagers, only Vanka Bieskrebnov has come back. He saw Grigor ill in Katerinodar, and I don't believe any of the other stories. But what do they say, Granny? We were told a Cossack of Singin village had said that the Reds had killed Grigor at Navarosisk. I walked all the way to Singin, 
A mother's heart can't remain in suspense and found the Cossack. He denied every word of it. He said he hadn't seen or heard of Gregor. Then there was another rumor that he'd been put in prison and that he'd died there of typhus. Ilinichna's eyes drooped and she was long silent, examining her gnarled heavy hands. The old woman's face, her cheeks pendulous with age, were tranquil. Her lips were pressed sternly together. But suddenly a cherry-colored flush flooded her swarthy cheeks, and her eyelids began to flicker. She looked at Oxenia with dry, ecstatically burning eyes and said hoarsely, But I don't believe it. It can't be that I've been robbed of my last son. God has no cause to punish me. I've only got a little time left to live now, only a very little time left to live, and my cup of sorrow has been filled to overflowing without that. Grisha's alive. My heart has had no sign, and so my darling's alive. Oxenia turned away without speaking. There was a long silence in the kitchen. Suddenly the wind blew the porch door wide open, and they heard the flood water roaring among the poplars on the farther side of the dawn, and the wild geese anxiously calling to one another above the waters. Oxenia closed the door and went and leaned against the stove. Don't grieve over him, Granny, she said quietly. Can illness bowl a man like him over? He's strong, as strong as iron. Such men don't die. In a crackling frost he rode all the way without gloves. Did he talk about the children at all? Ilinichna asked wearily. He mentioned both you and the children. Are they well? They're well. What can harm them? But our Pantelyem and Prokofitch died during the retreat. We're left alone. Aksinya silently crossed herself. She was amazed at the calm with which the old woman had told of the death of her husband. Resting her hands on the table, Ilinichna rose heavily. Here I've been sitting with you, and it's already dark in the yard, she remarked. Sit as long as you like, Granny. Dunya's in the house alone. I ought to go. As she adjusted the kerchief over her head, she looked around the kitchen and knitted her brows. Your stove's smoking. You should have arranged for someone to come and live here when you went off. Well, goodbye. As she took hold of the door latch, she said without turning her head, when you've settled down a bit, come over and see us. Pay us a visit, and perhaps you'll get news of Gregor and can tell us. From that day, there was a complete change in the relations between the Myalyakovs and Aksinya. Their anxiety for Gregor's life seemed to bring them closer and make them kin. Next morning, Dunya saw Aksinya in the yard, called to her, went up to the fence, and putting her arms around Aksinya's thin shoulders, smiled at her pleasantly and simply, Oh, how thin you've got, Aksinya. You're nothing but skin and bone. You'd get thin with such a life, Aksinya smiled in answer, feeling a pang of jealousy as she noted the girl's crimson face, a bloom with mature beauty. Did Mother come to see you yesterday? Dunya asked, for some reason dropping her voice to a whisper. Yes, I thought she did. Did she ask about Grisha? Yes, and she didn't cry at all? No, she's a stout-hearted old woman. Giving Oxenia a trustful look, Dunya said, It would have been better if she had. Things would have been easier for her. You know, Xenia, she's grown so wonderful since this past winter. She's not at all like she used to be. When she heard about father, I thought her heart would break. I was terribly frightened. But she didn't let fall a single tear. She only said, May he enter the heavenly kingdom. My man has ended his sufferings. And until nightfall, she said nothing to anybody. I tried to talk to her about all sorts of things, but she just waved me off and was silent. The misery I had over her that day. But in the evening, I collected the cattle, came in from the yard and asked her, Mother, shall we cook anything for supper? Then her pain passed and she began to talk. Dunya sighed and thoughtfully gazing across Oxenia's shoulder asked, is our Gregor dead? Is it true what people are saying? I don't know, dear. Dunya gave Aksinya a sidelong, questioning look and sighed still more deeply. Mother's nothing but yearning for him. She never speaks of him except as my youngest, and she simply won't have it that he may not be alive still. 
But you know, Xenia, if she learns that he's really dead, she'll die of sorrow herself. All life has left her now. The sole hope to which she clings is Gregor. Even to the children, she's become unwanted, sort of. And at work, everything falls from her hands. You just think, in one year, there's been four of our family. Moved by compassion, Oxenia leaned across the fence, embraced Dunya, and gave her a strong kiss on the cheek. Get your mother occupied with something, my dear. Don't let her grieve too much. What can you occupy her with? Dunya wiped her eyes with the corner of her kerchief and asked, You come and see us sometimes and talk to her. That'll make it easier for her. You've got no reason to shun us. I'll drop in sometimes. I will, you see. I ought to be going out to the fields tomorrow. We've harnessed up with Anikushka's widow. We want to sow a little wheat. Are you thinking of sowing anything for yourself? I'm a fine sower. Oxenia smiled a cheerless smile. I've got nothing to sow. And besides, what's the good? I don't need much for myself. I'll manage to exist somehow. Any news of your Stepan? No, not a word. Oxenia answered unconcernedly and said to her own surprise, I'm not over-anxious about him. The confession slipped from her unexpectedly, and she felt embarrassed. To cover her confusion, she hurriedly added, Well, goodbye, girl. I must go into the hut to tidy up. Dunya pretended she had not noticed Oxenia's confusion and looked away as she said, Wait a moment. I just wanted to ask you, wouldn't you give us a hand with the work? The earth will be dried out. I'm afraid we shan't be able to manage, and there are only two Cossacks left in all the village, and they're lame. Oxenia willingly agreed, and satisfied, Dunya went off to make her preparations. All day she methodically made ready for the next morning. With the help of Anikushka's widow, she sieved the seed, managed to mend the harrow, greased the wagon wheels, put the sower in order, in the evening she raked some sieved seed corn into a kerchief and carried it to the cemetery, sprinkling it over the graves of Pyotr, Natalia, and Daria, so that next day the birds would fly to her relatives' graves. In the simplicity of her heart she believed that the dead would hear the merry twittering of the birds and would rejoice. Only during the hour before dawn did silence descend over the dawn lands, Muffledly the water gurgled through the inundated forest, washing the pale green trunks of the poplars, measuredly swinging the flooded summits of the oak saplings and the young aspens. Bowed by the current in the overflowing lakes, the panicles of the bulrushes rustled. Over the flooded fields, along the lonely creeks, where the flood water stood motionless as though frozen, reflecting the twilight of the starry heaven, the barnacle geese called very softly, the male teals whistled sleepily, and rarely the silvery trumpet voices of migrant swans sounded. At times a fish growing fat in the flooded expanse splashed in the darkness. A fluid wave went rolling far over the scintillating water, and the warning cackle of a startled bird was heard. Then, once more, the dawnside lands were wrapped in silence. But with the dawn, just as the chalky spurs of the hills were turning rosy, a ground breeze started up. Heavy and strong, it blew against the current. Great seven-foot waves piled high along the river. The water seethed furiously in the forest. The trees groaned as they swayed. All day the wind roared to die away late in the night, and this weather lasted for several days. A lilac haze curtained the steppe. The earth had dried out. The grasses were halted in their growth. Fissures ran across the autumn-plowed fields. The ground was drying more and more with every hour. But in the fields belonging to Tatarsk, hardly anyone was to be seen. In all the village, only a few senile greybeards were left. Only frost-bitten and sick or disabled Cossacks had returned from the retreat, and only women and youths were at work in the fields. The wind drove the dust about the depopulated village, banged the shutters of the huts, rummaged among the straw on the roofs of the sheds. 
This year we shall be without bread, said the old men, only women in the fields, and even so only every third house is sowing, and dead earth won't give birth. Dunya and the other women had been two days sowing when at sunset Oxenia drove the bullocks down to the pond. At the dam, holding a saddled horse by the rein, was the ten-year-old son of the Obnazovs. The horse was chewing with its lips, sprinkling drops of water from its velvety gray muzzle, but the boy was amusing himself, throwing clumps of dry clay into the water and watching the rings rippling wider and wider. Where are you off to, Vanka? Aksinya asked. I've brought food out to mother. Well, and what news is there in the village? Oh, nothing. Granddad Gerasim caught a fine carp in his net last night, and Fyodor Mielnikov has returned from the retreat. Rising on tiptoe, the lad bridled the horse, took a strand of the mane in his hand, and with impish agility sprang into the saddle. He rode away from the pond as a sedate farmer should, at a walking pace. But when he had got a little way, he glanced back at Oxenia and set off at a gallop, and his faded blue shirt blew out like a balloon behind him. Oxenia stretched herself out on the dam while the bullocks were drinking, and there and then decided to go back to the village. Mielnikov was a soldier Cossack, and he ought to have some news of Gregor's fate. When she drove the bullocks back to the encampment, she said to Dunya, I'm going off to the village. I'll be back early in the morning. On business? Yes. She returned next morning. As she went up to Dunya, who was harnessing the bullocks, she was unconcernedly swinging a switch, but her brows were knitted, and the corners of her lips were folded bitterly. Fyodor Mielnikov's come home. I went and asked him about Gregor. He doesn't know anything, she said briefly, and, turning sharply, went to the sower. After the sowing, Oxenia set to work on her own farm. She sowed watermelons in the melon plot, plastered and whitewashed the hut, and, to the best of her ability, covered the roof of the shed with what straw she had left. The days passed by in work, but her anxiety for Gregor did not abate. She was reluctant to think of Stepan, and for some reason she felt sure he would not return. Yet when one or another of the Cossacks came home, her first question was always, You haven't seen my Stepan, have you? And only then did she try discreetly to ferret out some news of Gregor. Everybody in the village knew of their liaison, and even the scandal-loving women had stopped gossiping about them. But Axenia was ashamed to disclose her feelings, and only rarely, when some taciturn returned soldier made no mention of Gregor, did she ask, narrowing her eyes and obviously embarrassed, But you haven't chanced to see our neighbor Gregor Pantelievich, have you? His mother's anxious about him. She's quite pining away. None of the village Cossacks had seen either Gregor or Stepan after the Dawn Army's surrender at Novorossiysk, but at the end of June a regimental comrade of Stepan's called to see Aksinya as he was making his way back to his own village. He informed her, Stepan's gone to the Crimea. It's the truth I'm telling you. I saw him with my own eyes getting on the boat. I didn't get a chance of having a word with him. There was such a crowd that they were walking on the people's heads. When she asked about Gregor, he gave her an evasive answer. I saw him on the quay. He was wearing epaulets, but I haven't seen him since. They've carried off a lot of officers to Moscow, and who's to know where he is now? But a week later, Prokhor Zikhov turned up at Tatarsk. He was wounded and was brought from Milyarova station in a wagon. When she heard the news, Aksinya stopped milking the cow, let the calf go to its mother, and putting on her kerchief as she went, hurried almost at a run to the Zikov's yard. At any rate, Prokhor will know. He ought to know, she thought as she went. But supposing he says Gregor's dead, what shall I do then? And at every step she slowed down more and more, pressing her hand to her heart, fearful of hearing black news. Smiling broadly, hiding the stump of his left arm behind his back, Prokhor welcomed her in the best room. Hello, comrade in arms. Greetings. I'm glad to see you, and we were thinking you'd given up the ghost in that little village. Ah, you lay there pretty bad. Well, and how beautiful it, typhus, I mean, makes the likes of you. But see how the poles have carved me up, damn them? 
Crocker showed the knotted sleeve of his khaki tunic. When my wife saw it, she wept and cried. But I told her, don't bellow like that, you fool. Others have their heads chopped off and don't complain. But an arm's nothing at all. They can always make a wooden one for you. And at any rate, a wooden arm won't be afraid of the cold. And if it gets cut off, it doesn't bleed. The only pity, my girl, is that I haven't learned to manage with one hand. I can't button up my trousers. There's the rub. I've traveled all the way home from Kiev with them unbuttoned. It's shameful, so you must excuse me if you notice I'm untidy. Well, come in and sit down. You'll be our guest, won't you? We'll have a chat while my wife's out. I sent her out for vodka, the Antichrist. Here her husband arrives home with one arm torn off and she hasn't anything to drink his health in. You women are all the same when your husbands are away. I know you all too well, you wet-tailed devils. You might tell me. I know. I'll tell you. He asked me to give you a bow like this. Prochor jokingly bowed, raised his head, and lifted his eyebrows in amazement. Well, that's a fine to-do. What are you crying for, you fool? You women are all twisted of the same yarn. If their man is killed, they cry. If he comes home alive, they still cry. Wipe your eyes. Wipe your eyes. What are you sniveling like that for? At Novorossiysk, he and I joined Comrade Budioni's cavalry, the 14th Division. Our Grigor Pantolievich took command of a company, a squadron, I mean. Of course, I became his orderly, and we rode to Kiev by forced marches. Well, girl, we gave those Poles a taste. As we went, Grigor Pantolievich said, I've killed Germans, I've tried my sword on all sorts of Austrians, I don't suppose the Poles' brain boxes are any stronger. I think it'll be easier sabring them than our own Russians, don't you? And he winked at me and bared his teeth. He changed completely when he joined the Red Army. He grew quite cheerful and as sleek as a gelding. Well, but he and I didn't manage to get along without a family quarrel. One day I rode up to him and said by way of a joke, Time we call a halt, Your Excellency, Comrade Melyakov. He rolled his eyes at me and said, You drop that sort of joke or it'll be the worse for you. That same evening he sent for me about something or other, and the devil himself put it into my head to call him Excellency again. The way he snatched up his mauser. He went quite white and bared his teeth like a wolf. And he's got a full mouth of teeth, at least a troop of them. I ducked under a horse's belly and got away from him. He all but killed me, the devil. Well, we arrived at the Ukraine and tried out the Poles. They're not bad fighters, but a little weak in the back. They're as puffed up with pride as a turkey cock. But they can run well when you press them hard. Maybe he'll come home on leave, Oxenia stammered. Don't you think of it, Proker snorted. He says he's going to serve until he's atoned for his past sins. And he'll do it. A fool's task isn't difficult. He led us into the attack close to one small town, and I myself saw him cut down four of their Ulans. The devil's been left-handed ever since he was a child, and so he gave it to them from both sides. After the battle, Budioni himself shook hands with him in front of the regiment, and he and the squadron were thanked. That's the sort of kettle he's kicking over, your Pantelievich. Aksinya listened as though dazed. She recovered from the daze only at the Melyukov's gate. Dunya was in the porch, sipping milk. Without raising her head, she asked, Have you come for the leaven? I know I promised to bring it along, but I forgot. But glancing at Oxenia's eyes, wet with tears, beaming with happiness, she understood all without a word. Pressing her flaming face to Dunya's shoulder, panting with joy, Oxenia whispered, Alive and well, he sent his greetings. Go now, go and tell mother. Chapter 2 Of all the Tatarsk Cossacks who had retreated with the Whites, by the summer some thirty men had returned. The majority were old men and elderly Cossack soldiers, and except for sick and wounded, the Cossacks in the prime of life were still missing. Some of them were in the Red Army. Others, members of Vrangel regiments, were biding their time in the Crimea, preparing for a new advance into the Dawn area. A good half of those who had gone would remain forever in strange lands. Some had perished of typhus, others had found death during the final struggles against the enemy in the Kuban. A number who had been separated from the main forces were frozen to death in the steppe beyond Manich. 
Two were taken prisoner by guerrillas and had vanished without trace. There were many Cossacks missing from Tatarsk. The women spent their days in tense and anxious expectation, gazing under their palms. Who knows, perhaps some belated wayfarer might be coming along the high road in the lilac evening haze. Some ragged, lousy, and emaciated but long-expected master would come home, and at once there would be a joyous, aimless bustle in his hut. Water was heated for the dirt-blackened soldier. The children vied with one another in waiting on their father and watched his every movement. Half-crazed with happiness, the housewife ran to lay the table, then rushed to the chest to get out a clean set of her husband's underwear. But as though of malice, the linen proved to be unmended, and the housewife's trembling fingers simply could not get the thread through the needle eye. At that happy moment, even the yard dog, which had recognized its master a long way off and had run behind him as far as the threshold, licking his hand, was allowed to come into the hut. The children escaped scot-free, even if they broke a utensil or spilled milk, and all they did went unpunished. Before the master had had time to change into clean clothes after his bath, the hut was crowded with women. They came to learn the fate of their own dear ones, and caught fearfully and greedily at every word the Cossack said. A little later, a woman would go out into the yard, pressing her palms to her tear-stained face, and would walk along the lane as though blind, not choosing her road. And then in one of the little homes a new widow would lament over her dead, and the thin voices of weeping children would accompany her. So was it in Tatarsk. The joy which came to one house brought implacable woe to another. Next morning the master, clean-shaven, looking much younger, rose almost before dawn, went round the farm, and noted the jobs which needed to be attended to at once. Immediately after breakfast he set to work. Merrily the plane hissed or the axe tapped somewhere under the eaves of a shed in the cool, as though announcing that capable masculine hands, greedy for work, had come home to that yard. But in the house and yard, where they had learned of the death of a father and husband, a mute silence reigned. Silent lay the mother, prostrated with grief, and around her crowded the orphan children, grown old in one night. Whenever Ilinichna heard that another Cossack had returned, she said, And when will our man come home? Others come back, but there's not a word of ours. They're not discharging the young Cossacks. Don't you understand, mother? Dunya answered her in a vexed tone. How aren't they discharging them? What about Tikhon Gerasimov? He's a year younger than Grisha. But he's wounded, mother. What sort of wound has he got? Ilinichna objected. I saw him outside the smithy yesterday, and he was walking along as though on parade. Wounded men don't go about like that. He was wounded, but he's getting better now. Well, and hasn't our man been wounded quite a lot? His body is marked all over with scars. Don't you think he needs to get better, too? Dunya did her best to make her mother see that it was no use hoping for Gregor's return yet a while, but it was no easy task to convince Ilinichna of anything. Shut up, fool, she ordered Dunya. I know as much as you, and you're still young to teach your mother. I say he ought to come home, and that means he will come home. Go away, go away. I don't want to waste my breath on you. The old woman waited for her son with the utmost impatience, and mentioned him at every possible opportunity. Whenever Mishatka was disobedient to her, she threatened him. You wait till your father comes home, you bristle-haired little devil. I'll tell him, and he'll lay it on you. If she happened to see a wagon with new ribs in its sides as it passed the window, she sighed and invariably remarked, You can see by its state that the master's at home, but our wagon looks as though someone had ordered the road to come home. All her life, Ilinichna had never liked tobacco smoke, and she had always driven smokers out of the kitchen. But now she changed even in this respect. Go and ask Prochor to come along, she often told Dunya. Let him come and smoke a cigarette, for the place smells of the dead. Now when Grisha comes back from service, then the house will smell as though a Cossack lives in it. Every day she cooked extra food, and after dinner she always set an iron pot full of cabbage soup on the stove. 
When Dunya asked her why she did it, Ilinichna answered in astonishment, Why, what else should I do? Our soldier may come home today, and then he can have something hot to eat at once. For while you're heating this and that up, he may be going hungry. One day, when Dunya returned home from the melon plot, she saw Gregor's old coat and peaked cap with its faded red band hanging on a nail in the kitchen. She looked at her mother interrogatively, and, smiling guiltily and miserably, Ilinichna said, I got them out of the chest, Dunya. You see them as you come in from the yard, and it makes things seem more homelike, as though he was already back. Dunya grew tired of this endless talk of Gregor. One day she could stand no more and reproached her mother. Mother, don't you ever get tired of always talking about one and the same thing? You've made everybody sick with your conversation. All we hear from you is Grisha, Grisha. Why should I grow tired of talking about my own son? You wait till you bear children, and then you'll know, Ilinichna answered quietly. After that she took Gregor's cap and coat out of the kitchen into her room, and for several days she said not a word about him. But not long before the haying, she said to Dunya, You may get angry when I talk about Grisha, but how are we going to live without him? Have you ever stopped to think about that, silly? Here is mowing time coming on, and we've got nobody to sharpen even the hayrake. Look how everything's gone to rack and ruin, and you and I can't keep up with it. When the master's absent, even the chattels weep. Dunya said nothing. She realized well enough that it was not by any means the farm problems that were troubling her mother, but they served only as an excuse for talking about Gregor and for unburdening her soul. Ilinichna began to yearn for her son with renewed force, and she could not hide her feelings. That evening she refused her supper, and when Dunya asked if she were feeling ill, she answered reluctantly, I've grown old, and my heart is aching after Grisha. It's aching so much that nothing pleases me, and it's painful even for my eyes to look out on the world. But it was not Gregor who was destined to act the master in the Mielyakov yard. Just before the hay mowing, Mishka Kashevoy arrived home from the front. He spent the night with distant relations and called on the Mielyakovs next morning. Ilinichna was cooking when, politely knocking at the door and receiving no answer, he entered the kitchen, took off his old soldier's cap, and smiled at her. Hello, Auntie Ilinichna. You weren't expecting me, were you? Good morning. And who are you to me that I should be expecting you? Are you first cousin switched to our wattle fence? Ilinichna answered roughly, staring angrily at Kushavoy's hated face. Not in the least discountenanced by this reception, Mishka said, After all, we were acquaintances, and nothing more. But that's enough for me to come to see you. I'm not going to live with you. That pleasure hasn't come my way yet, Ilinichna pronounced, and taking no more notice of the visitor, returned to her cooking. Paying no attention to her words, Mishka looked around the kitchen and said, I've called to see you and find out how you're getting on. We haven't seen each other for a year or more. We haven't missed you over much, Ilinichna snorted, furiously shifting the pots about over the coals. Dunya was dressing in the best room. Hearing Mishka's voice, she turned pale and silently clapped her hands. Seating herself on the bench and not daring to move, she listened to the conversation in the kitchen. A deep flush suddenly flamed in her face, then her cheeks went so pale that little stripes of white emerged down the fine hook of her nose. She heard Mishka striding heavily about the kitchen, sit down on a chair which creaked beneath him, then strike a match. The scent of cigarette smoke floated into the best room. I hear your old man's died. Yes. And Gregor? Ilinichna was long silent. Then with obvious reluctance she answered, He's serving with the Reds. He's got the same sort of star on his cap as you have. He should have put it on long before. That's his business. There was a distinct note of anxiety in Mishka's voice as he asked, And Yevdokya Pantelyevna? She's dressing. You're too early a visitor. Good folk aren't about so soon. You'll have to be bad folk. I wanted to see you, and so I came. Why should I pick and choose the time? Oh, Mikhail, don't make me angry with you. 
How am I making you angry, Auntie? Why buy all this? I'm sorry, but buy all what? Why, by the way you're talking? Dunya heard Mishka sigh deeply. She could stand no more. She jumped up, pulled down her skirt, and went into the kitchen. Mishka was sitting by the window, finishing a cigarette. His skin was yellow, and he was so emaciated that he was almost unrecognizable. His faded eyes lit up, and a hardly perceptible flush appeared on his cheeks when he saw Dunya. Rising hurriedly, he said hoarsely, Well, good morning. Good morning, Dunya answered almost inaudibly. Go and fetch water, Ilinichna at once ordered, glancing at her daughter. Mishka patiently waited for Dunya to return. Ilinichna said nothing. He also was silent, but at last he crushed his cigarette end between his fingers and asked, Why are you so annoyed with me, Auntie? Have I crossed your road or what? Ilinichna swung round from the stove as though stung. How does your conscience let you come here, you shameless eyes? she said. And yet you dare to ask me that? You murderer? <laughs>